The Feudal Future Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have with us two experts who are going to be talking about the relationship between Western Europe and the United States and things that are happening within Western Europe that may have some structural implications to how those relations go. First is Ambassador Ron Spogli, former ambassador to Italy and the great Republic of San Marino. Ron, <laughs> Ambassador Spogli, welcome. Thank you. And Fraser Myers, who is the deputy editor at Spite. Fraser, welcome. Thanks for having me. Joel, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I um, I was just in Europe uh, in October um, and got great restaurant uh, recommendations in uh, in Italy from from Ambassador Spogli. But what I was struck by was the discomfort over the massive migration that's taking place and what the political implications. I mean, this was something that came up in conversations with almost every particularly French person that we talk to. Um, so, I mean, how is this going to affect European politics and the relationship with the U.S., which has some of the same issues? Um, so, um, uh, Ron, do you want to start? or Sure, I'll start off because, <clears throat> thank you very much, appreciate it. If Ambassador is not uh, able to give out um, uh, good recommendations for restaurants, then he has very little value in the world. <laughs> At least I was able to be helpful in that regard. Um, we can start with Italy, not, not because it is the most important um, for um, a lot of issues, but as it relates to the immigration question, it has been on the front line and on the front line, as you know, for some time. And already the issue has affected uh, Italian politics and, and the uh, election of uh, or the rise of Giorgio Maloney, the first um, woman prime minister in Italy um, is in part due to the fact that she took a position um, uh, during her campaign um, to um, do what she could to curtail uh, unauthorized um, immigration uh, into Italy and ultimately up into the northern portions of the European Union. Um, the, the issue has been longstanding in Italy. Uh, Lampedusa, as you know, is the closest European outpost to Africa. And although the migratory patterns have changed uh, to be coming mostly from Tunisia today, um, as opposed to Libya for, for much of uh, the last 10 years, um, the actual number of, of people coming uh, has never been greater than it has been in, in 2023. Uh, so uh, it is a real issue. It's an issue that affected Italian politics. It was one of the reasons why she was successful in becoming uh, prime minister. And as we well know, and 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 certainly, as Fraser can say, uh, much more eloquently than I can, um, the um, the recent uh, victory of Wilders in, in, in uh uh, and Holland was in no small measure due to the stance that he took on on, on immigration. So it is already affecting in a major way uh, politics uh, in in the EU. Well, and Fraser, you recently wrote a great article on the victory of uh, Wilders in, in the Netherlands. How broadly held is this um, growing populist view, especially around immigration, but around other things, uh, throughout the rest of uh, Western Europe? Well, I think I think the key thing to understand is that populism is now very much a permanent part of the European landscape. There was a lot of um, victory, la early victory laps, I would say, in 2020, 2021, during the pandemic, saying that populism had been put back uh, in its box. You know, the odd victory here and there for someone like Emmanuel Macron or um, the previous Dutch government, um, Centre right government did did pretty well in the previous elections, so there was a sense that you know we've the genie's back in in the bottle. We don't need to worry about um, the, this populist wave anymore. Um, the first wave did have a lot to do with migration, you know, around um, the refugee crisis around uh, 2014 2015. Um, that was a big you know early driver of some of these some of these movements. I think what's interesting is that um, 
fears over migration express themselves in different ways in different countries. So um, in France, it, it relates much more to questions about Islamism, uh, Islamist terrorism. In Sweden, people uh, have a fear about crime more generally. I mean, people may have heard some shocking statistics from Sweden um, where they elected last year the, um, or they gave you know huge uh, amounts of votes to the Sweden Democrats, this kind of uh, upstart right wing party. Uh, there, you know, crime is just through the roof. It's gone from being a peaceful country to uh, having some of the, you know, almost like third world levels of uh, explosions. So there is a sense, I think, that um, I don't think that Europeans are becoming more racist necessarily or anything like that. But there is a sense that they're losing control of uh, their society. Often immigration is the the, the place or the issue where people feel most acutely that they are not being listened to. Um, and that's particularly relevant in Europe because, you know, half of the migration to most European countries is from the EU. Um, it's There is freedom of movement as a condition of EU membership. Um, I know that non-EU migration has risen massively, and that's probably what's put a lot of things on the map. But the fact is that people don't really have control um, over migration or don't feel that their governments can control it. Um, and that is a huge source of um, frustration. I mean, in Britain, we saw we've left the European Union. Now our government um, has also uh, let in record numbers of people. And there, at least there is a sort of sense of accountability. We know that that's what um, the government believes in high levels of migration, or at least, you know, through its actions, if not through its words. But there's a sense in Europe that, you know, governments will say we'll get down immigration and they don't do anything. And that and that's, leads to kind of frustration. Yeah, I think that point is um, very, very well made. I think that if anything, with the rising number of people who um, support some sort of immigration reform, I think clearly the notion here is there's a plenty of space between being a xenophobic racist on the one hand and and wanting some sort of of reasonable um of immigration as the italian foreign minister uh said the other day we want to determine who comes uh to italy as opposed to having the traffickers determine who comes to italy and ultimately the the um the eu so, so i think that that to a significant degree it at least opens up the debate uh, much more significantly to a discussion on you know, shouldn't we all think seriously about immigration reform? We've kicked this can down the road, certainly in the United States, to a very significant degree with consequences that I don't think have been completely realized, but I think they're potentially on the horizon. There's the threat alerts in the United States are, are very high currently. It would be extremely easy for something to happen emanating from people crossing an open border effectively. So I, I think it opens the space to having a much more reasonable conversation as opposed to this, we talked about it earlier, Manichaean view, black or white, either you're for open immigration or you're a racist xenophobe. Well, I, you know, thinking about it beyond the immigration issue per se, thinking about it in terms of say, um, multinational uh, cooperation across European borders. How likely is this immigration issue to erode the other areas of cooperation within Europe that have made the EU successful as a as a, a relationship? I think it's it's one of the key um, dividing lines in in Europe. I mean, there are, there's always going to be dividing lines within the EU. Ten years ago, there was a sort of north south divide um, over public spending and the approach to the economy. Now there's a sort of I think a bit of an east-west divide. Uh, Eastern Europe is very much not on board with um, high levels of migration. Very resistant to what the EU slightly Orwellian is. They got a slightly Orwellian term for you know sort of migrant quotas. They call it mandatory solidarity. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think yeah, and that has the that has the potential to scupper all kinds of um, other forms of EU cooperation. Certainly. Um, it remains to be seen what will happen next year. There will be a uh, European Union, a European Parliament elections that could have uh, some influence uh, on the approach. But the, I mean, the current, I guess the current supranational, the current EU approach is take people in and share them out. And that just has completely broken down. People are just not having that. So instead of that, what you just get is poor Italy and Greece having to 
you know, take all these large numbers of people purely because they're geographically closest to to Africa. But you know, one of the uh, conundrums we have in the U.S., but even more so with Europe and particularly countries like Italy. On the one hand, you know, people are afraid of all this migration. On the other hand, these countries have incredibly low birth rates. Um, you know, the the, uh, the the labor force is shrinking. Um, is there any discussion about how to address that without having essentially open borders? Well, interesting you would men make that comment, Joe, because... Um, Going back to the Italian example, Maloney um, ran on a platform, as I mentioned earlier, that was was clearly much harder against immigration. And yet a year into her um, mandate, uh, she's been relatively soft on it versus expectations. And she has in, indeed encouraged, um, and it, Italians have indeed hired, a significant number of um, of migrants um, in order to solve their labor issue, because there are significant areas where they do need labor that Italians are unwilling to do the jobs they did years ago, a phenomenon that exists in many parts of the world. So um, she said one thing, she's acted differently in part to address the issue that you just raised. It's the, is the U.S., my my sense is that there's some benefits from a U.S. perspective, from a foreign policy perspective, of having <clears throat> this multinational layer to um, to deal with, as opposed to having to have a separate a separate policy for every country within Europe. Is that in danger of breaking down as a result of all of this? I mean, where where do you think the U.S. foreign policy is going to be going in response to what's happening on the ground in Europe? Ron, do you want to answer that? Sure. Fraser? Um, I think, I think the, well, what we are seeing certainly is um, a coming split potentially, or, or certainly in sort of grassroots politics, you are seeing, um, I suppose this is less relevant to the EU, but there, there is a, um, a kind of turn against NATO in some places. I mean, it's a it's a it's a mixed picture because there are parts of Europe, you know, you think Sweden wasn't a member of NATO and is suddenly signing up thanks to the Ukraine war. Many Eastern European countries are, um, you know, have become and always were kind of stalwarts for it um, because they have Russia on their border. But there are other sort of populist candidates who are starting to question that, starting to question, um, particularly in relation to Ukraine. But also they share similar that some of those might be against the war in Ukraine, but they might also be agree in agreement with um, America's Israel policy, for instance. So it's a very kind of mixed picture, I, I would say, um, in terms of foreign policy. And I think going forward, I, I would agree with that. And, and I think going forward, um, it's going to be very dependent upon who the next president is. I think we could have very significant uh, change potentially. Uh, in uh, the uh, approach the United States takes to these issues in Europe, depending upon who is who is the next president. Um, uh, another issue, and because uh, Fraser raised the I Israel question, um, one of the things that that I wonder about it in terms of the impact on on immigration policy has been the kind of response we see on the streets um, in the universities. Um, here in the U.S. and in Europe, um, whether that's um, making people have some second thoughts. I mean, I think, uh, uh, Fraser, I think you, you may have said something that a friend of yours, a Jewish friend from Manchester, uh, mm. canceled a trip to London because of the demonstrations. I'm having, you know, coffee tomorrow with a, uh, uh, with a, with a Chapman student who has faced some of, of these kinds of issues. Um, is is the whole Hamas thing accelerating the the, the this issue and maybe uh, creating some other divides in Europe? Yeah, I think it's not it's not the conflict itself that is um, causing problems. It's it's the demonstrations and people are seeing um, may, maybe for the first time or starting to see that there are a lot of people who are not just you know 
it'd be one thing if they're just protesting uh, for Palestine um, out of sympathy for Gaza. But what people are seeing is outright, you know, anti-Semitism on the streets. They're seeing um, chants for jihad. And, you know, maybe a lot of those people were less, it, it just makes the issue much more visible. And a lot of people have speculated that this might have played a role in, in Wilder's victory. You know, the fact that in this was happening in the run up to the election. Israel was absolutely not a, an election issue there. Um, but these protests were clearly, yeah, uh, just yet another uh, visual sign of uh, how uh, immigration has, has changed people's countries and changed the character of things. Thinking about also a country like like France, where you have these significant populations, the largest Jewish population, you got the largest Muslim population. You've, you've got a, a, a real hotbed of, of, uh, of potential turmoil. And indeed, the number of uh, anti-Semitic uh, events that have taken place in France since uh, October the 7th have really been been significant. So, so, so much, much more during that period to today than than in all of twenty two. So, so, so you've you've got the conditions here uh, for um, um, you know ex extreme behaviors, and um, and there's no doubt that that that's uh, you know weighing on on folks. I, I think in 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 the United States and in in other countries in Europe, to be sure. It's also worth pointing out that in um, France and Germany, at least, these uh, pro-Palestine marches are illegal. Um, yeah. They have been banned by the governments, and they are, but they are happening anyway. So again, on top of the, the issues we've just raised, that it, it, it gives a sense of uh, lawlessness, uh, a sense that people are not playing by the rules. If that makes sense, I mean, I don't think they should be banned. To be clear, you know, Europe should stand for free speech. But it, it, again, that adds to the angst around it, I think. Right, within civilized parameters. The, um, <clears throat> you know, looking at the um, size of the of the uh, Muslim population in places like France and Germany, uh, I just wonder the degree to which, if you start thinking about the definitions of populism, um, mm. how, how much of a threat to civil disorder these rep these um demonstrations represent w what do you think i think it's this is becoming really difficult for these governments to maintain order in their countries or is this is just kind of a a minor uh transitory issue yes yeah, it's, it's very difficult to say i mean i i could speak mainly from sort of london perspective where these marches haven't actually particularly led to disorder as such um but what people see is um, they see that it, so many things are illegal to say in this country. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, but they see the police um, not reacting to like quite blatant outbursts of racism or chanting for jihad or things that obviously appear uh, threatening and, and violent. And they see the police turn a blind eye. So there's more a sense. There's a sense that the authorities are almost appeasing it, turning a blind eye. Don't want to. The authorities don't want to stir up the hornet's nest of of, of cracking down on it. Again, I don't think they should crack down on it um, because a lot of it is as as horrible as it is. A lot of it is, is sort of legitimate um, political speech. Um, so that again, that that fuels the sense of double standards. That fuels the sense that um, other people are treated differently, even though they're you know potentially outsiders. We would not be treated in that in this way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, Marshall, um, whether it's transitory or, or a real uh, issue of potential disorder, it, it what, what strikes me um, is how pervasive this, um, this populist sentiment focused currently on, on the right, but certainly uh, exists on the left. But when you when you run through, obviously, builders in, 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 in the Netherlands, um, um, the alternative for Deutschland in Germany and its recent successes, for example, uh, Maloney in Italy, Le Pen in, and certainly in, in France, Orban in, 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 in Hungary, say nothing of Brexit, which preceded it and so on and so forth. I mean, th this is a continuing pattern of um, 
yes, populism, but what does it represent? Disenchantment with the ability of the current political order to uh, address some of the fundamental issues that these countries have faced for a long time. And we, we see it in the United States. We've seen it for a while on both the left and the right. And we know uh, the many issues that have not been addressed by the political order in America. And I think there's just a rising frustration. So I, I would see this continuing, potentially getting m more serious slash dangerous if these issues are not addressed yeah. and they're addressable. That's the point. They're, they're addressable. These are not intractable. They've been intractable, but they're not problems that don't have some solution. But governments, for a variety of reasons that we know, have been unable to address them in, in a way that that many people, a majority, hopefully, find acceptable. Yeah, you know, it's interesting looking at a kind of going down the historical memory lane. This is a little reminiscent of the 1960s and the shift between kind of what was the baby boom generation feeling as though the ills of society were not being uh, addressed by government and the, the real struggle that happened in that generational changeover. And I kind of feel as though we have this similar kind of juxtaposition of generations but and I, I, value systems. But I'd like to add something that I think is not being appreciated. Uh, and I'm not necessarily saying it's a good thing because there's some scary aspects. What we're seeing in the United States, for instance, is young people actually are beginning to move to the right and particularly white males. And when I looked at the votes um, that Le Pen is getting in, in, um, in France, what's happened in Italy, Maloney, the support um, for, for AFD in Germany, um, Wilders, the, all, uh, it seems to me that there's also a potential in which it's not just, you know, the, the media um, is saying, well, young people are here and, you know, the older people are the ones who are holding things back. But the reality is, I, I think young people, particularly if you're a young white person and, and and particularly a male, and you know that your chances of getting into a good college have dropped dramatically no matter what you do, that there are jobs that you cannot apply for. And if you bring that um, into, into European society, if you, you know, you might find that a lot of the young, you know, the young people, particularly the white males, particularly the working class, and I think this group is being totally and completely ignored in the media. They are just, they simply, they think the only young people in the world are, you know, lunatics at Sarah Lawrence in Yale. <laughs> Just to or, cover two of our colleges. <laughs> or dismissed as, as representing an, an abhorrent point of view. That's the other thing, too. You're either ignored or you're dismissed. Yeah. I think, I think well, one I thing to add into this, add into this calculus kind of middle class um, aspirations of having a family, you know, buying a house, you know, having a career that you could nurture. And to see those being jeopardized just yes. adds fuel to the fire. And you're right, Joel. It's, this is this is historically, young people have been associated with more left leaning ideas, and now we're seeing quite a shift in that. And, and if I could just make one additional comment, recent um, opinion polls have suggested that young people are much less optimistic about their future, right? Uh, than than their parents are much less optimistic about being able to have a standard of living that will be comparable forget exceeding, but comparable to what their parents are expressing. I think exactly what you're saying, Joel, that there is a significant disaffection that exists in that particular, in that particular um, demographic. And, and, and some of them are indeed uh, migrating closer to the right, who, who would appear to be uh, rightly or wrongly more able to address or more willing to address some of those issues, wh whether those are are good solutions being proposed or not is another question, but at least addressing the issue uh, in a way that perhaps the left in America is not. Yeah, I think I think it's really important to to raise this because there is just this assumption as well in in the UK that um, you know all young people are are basically Greta Thunberg, 
um, and that's the only way they think. And all boomers are right wing blowhards. And it's <laughs> not quite correct if you look at the certainly on the continent. It's actually the older people who were keeping the sort of centrist establishment parties alive, whereas younger people who don't have, um, you know, one of the main things I think is is not that necessarily young people are given to left or right. It's just they don't have the same loyalties to these old parties, these old parties that are clearly not uh, serving the public. And you can actually see this quite clearly in um, in Germany. You know, the the AFD is extremely popular, much more popular in East Germany, although the West Germany is, is catching up. And that's not because those people are more right, right wing in East Germany. I mean, they lived under socialism for Christ's sake. You know, they were a socialist country. Many people actually, um, many older people there, like look back fondly in some ways on, on that on that period. You know, people, nostalgia does funny things to people, right? But um, it's because they don't have the same connections to the main parties. You know, they've only been voting for the mainstream parties since the 1990s. So why should they show uh, any loyalty to them? Why should they expect, why should they believe their, the promises that are, that are made and are, are serially not kept? They think, so they think, well, we'll try something new. We'll try, we'll, we'll bet on a new force. And even just in the past, you know, sort of 10, 20 years of this populist wave, you've seen in different countries, new parties rise and fall. So, you know, we we're talking about Wilders. I mean, he's been around for, um, you know, 20 years or so. Um, it's taken him this long to uh, find some real success. But in the meantime, you know, the Dutch have been voting for um, the people may have heard of Pim Fortuyn, but he was assassinated before he could uh, make a real electoral impact. But even just in recent years, there was the Forum for a Democracy, which is run by this guy called Thierry Baudet. That was doing well. That came top in like the Senate elections a couple of years ago. This year, we had the Farmers Party come out of nowhere to come out, come top in the local elections. And then, and now, you know, only a few months later, Wilders comes out of nowhere and genuinely out of nowhere. You know, even he did not expect to do um, as well as he did. So there is a key aspect of this is, is just the volatility of it. Um, you know, when without the old certainties, without people having the same loyalties to the old parties, there's a lot to play for. Uh, there's a lot that, um, you know, can come up. People can rise as fall as they fall as fast as they rise. Uh, Italy is another good example. You know, we, before we got to Maloney, we had five star and the league. We tried that out. Didn't work out. Off you go. We'll try someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. And, and a willingness. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and a willingness to uh, at least ostensibly embrace solutions that we would find much more abhorrent like authoritarianism. But again, uh, what are you going to believe them or your lion eyes? It, it, it's it's hey. Uh, Putin is Putin, but Putin is effective in 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 carrying out certain policies. She is is an authoritarian, but China has been enormously effective in 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 accomplishing certain goals. And I think you see it in Europe, you see it in America. The notion is we are for a lot of issues sort of running in place and and not getting them done. So uh, the notion, that um, an authoritarian can come along and perhaps move things forward is is less important to those, as you say, who don't have a strong historical affiliation, if you will. Perhaps do not see uh, the importance that we see in, in democratic institutions and a democratic process, however inefficient uh, it may be. And so th that, that, again, goes back to the fundamental issues that if we're not going to solve what is what are perceived as the most pressing issues, or at least make some reasonable progress, we're going to see more and more embracing of extremist positions. I guess that's really, you know, I mean, this has been a great discussion. I just, you know, sort of summing up, what, what do you see happening in the future? Um, I mean, Ron sort of touched on it a, a bit, if you were to predict what the next five years in Europe are going to look like, can you make a prediction? I, I think the populist movement is definitely here to stay. And there are newer, all the time, there are newer issues, um, newer confrontations that need to be had out with the elites. So, you know, as well as immigration, you now have to add green politics. The opposition to greenism is a massive driver now of populism.
So not, you know, Holland is a great example of that, where we had just what ties the Dutch farmers together and get builders is the opposition to extreme climate policies. And they are very extreme here in Europe. It's nothing like the, uh, the US. Um, you know, people are seeing uh, in loads in so many Euro European countries um, for, for the first time in 20 years, a lot of, you know, mainstream leaders have had to say, actually, we've gone a bit too far. Rishi Sunak in the UK has at least rhetorically walked back on net zero. Uh, Emmanuel Macron has said we need a pause on all of these green targets. Um, you know, that is a get that's just going to be a huge feature, I think, of, of the coming politics, especially as these policies really start to to bite. And the problem is, as with so many of these things, they are either they are complete. There is complete consensus um, across Europe with mainstream politicians or some of these things are imposed uh, directly from the EU. So that makes them even more ripe for um, it, it, it can it, in a sense, it can only be outsiders that can challenge them, if that makes sense. So that uh, is just going to fuel it further. I right. betray, got the last word. Sorry. Yeah, I, I betray my. Well, I, I indicate my, my love of history when I comment that this issue that we're uh, summing up here, where, where Europe uh, you know, will be in the next uh, five years, I think we've seen the roadmap. Uh, we saw the rejection by the French and the Dutch in 2005 of the Constitution, a major event that stopped essentially on a political basis, the integration. We saw in 2016 Brexit, uh, and we're seeing the next manifestation of what I would argue is that trend, which is the rise of this pop the populism that we've been talking about. Um, Europe either has gone, in my judgment, too far or not far enough. It didn't go far enough to integrate, and it's gone too far, if you will, past the point where it was effective for most people, which was the economic um, successes of the common market uh, and, and and a much more integrated um, economic program, and so it's it's dealing with that contradiction now. It didn't get far enough, but it went too far, and I don't see that changing materially. I don't know what the next phase of this uh, or the next stop on this uh, road that we have been talking about, but I would say, I would assume it's going to be less integration than more integration. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Plus, when you start looking at the underlying factors that are opposing each other on each one of these issues, I don't see those being resolved anytime soon. And so um, the, the idea that there'll be kind of continued um, separation or nationalism or, you know, populism it seems to me to make a lot of sense. Yeah, well, gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for being guests on the Feudal Future podcast. And we look forward to having you back again to talk more about this. Thanks yeah, very thank much. You. Thank you. The Feudal Future.